I would say that actually makes us makes us live here. So uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever it is, wherever you are taking the time to join us here. Welcome to Ask Men's official Q&A dating advice hangout. I am so excited. We've got a ton of questions from our readers. We've got a couple of great guests here with us, and we are going to take all the time we can to really dig into some of the questions that range from everything in the dating world, everything in the sex world, and all those complicated things I think that probably fall in between in those gray areas, which is why we brought the experts. So without me rambling on for too long in the beginning here, let me throw it to our two guests who can introduce themselves. Why don't we start with you, Kevin? Why don't you say hello? Hello, Kevin Undergaro, boyfriend of Maria Menounos, friend of <laughs> mine. <laughs> That's, that really does qualify. That's all he is. That's the only thing that he is in the world. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Now let's let's say hi to our expert, Marnie. I think most of us here know who you are. Why don't you give us a little something about yourself? Tell us something exciting. Something exciting? Well, I'm here on this hangout with you guys. That's super exciting. It's like the first hangout we've ever done with each other. Actually, the first hangout I've ever done, so I'm very psyched about it. Um, but I'm Marnie from The Wing Girl Method, and I have been working and coaching men for the past decade on how to attract, date, seduce, and get any woman they want without being a douchebag. Wow, that is helpful yeah. advice. I think I'm, I'm going to have to pay closer attention, and I'm going to lose focus on my job here because I really <laughs> not being a douchebag part is very difficult for a lot of guys. Yeah. Um, all right, well, let's jump right in. We've got so many questions, but I figured a good one to start with is kind of uh, uh, let's start with a colorful one, and we're going to keep these a little bit anonymous. So if you guys are out there kind of hoping to hear your name side of the questions, uh, you know, feel free to uh, reach out to the Hangout site. I'll make sure to give you a shout. But we'll keep this one anonymous for the moment. Is you got an interesting question? I'm going to read it if you don't mind. Verbatim. Um, interesting because it says, this may sound kind of strange, Marty, but I really love being tickled. It's important for me that this is part of my sex life. How do I get her to tickle me and include this in my sex life and my relationship? So that speaks to tickling and, you know, how do you bring interesting kind of new sexual dynamics and this being an example into a relationship or, you know, sooner rather than later? Well, it speaks to tickling, but it speaks to like a much broader um, story here. It's about talking and communicating with your partner or the people that you're having sex with about what your needs are and what you want. So there's there's a couple of ways that you can do this. You can be very straightforward and say, you know what, honey or sweetie or whatever you call your girlfriend or your wife or the person that you're dating, and you say, I want to talk to you about something. I really, really enjoy tickling during sex and I would love to add that to our bedroom experience or whatever whatever tickling is for you it may be something with your feet or something I don't know whatever other fetish that you have and you say to her like I would really love to incorporate this into our sex life if you're not comfortable being that straightforward with your significant other then what you can do is in the bedroom you can start incorporating your likes and wants into what you're doing so you can say to her you know what it feels great when you tickle the side of uh, my torso or it feels great when you tickle my feet or do you like when I do this to you because tickling is really nice for me so that's like a, a, a not as pushy or as assertive way um, of saying what you like in the bedroom. So you want to be suggestive. I, I, my first instinct is I would probably avoid using the word torso at any point if I'm in a bad mood. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know why I chose a torso. For me, I love being tickled there. That's the thing. I love it as a woman because that's a huge erogenous zone for uh, women. For men, I, I know that there's other areas, but yes, uh, probably so don't use torso well, in the well, that's, communication. That's actually asking other men. Kevin, this type of like bringing, you've been in a relationship for a long time. I mean, you've been in other relationships, presumably, so... You know, kind of getting into that adventurous spirit, like, have you ever had kind of an awkward situation where you try to break something in? Is there something that in your experience you think is the way to handle that? I think it's funny because recently I had a little bit of a breakthrough where I had the guts to talk to my girlfriend about something, but it's really working up the courage. I mean, Marnie's advice is spot on. It's getting the courage to say it without feeling awkward. So... Maybe it's introducing it, like she said. Can you tickle me a little bit? I really like that. But I think you, it's if you it, if you do get the courage, it's just asking them directly. Maybe it's not in the moment. Maybe it's on the side, and maybe it's saying, it, "It's uh, I really would like that," or "It's really important to me." I don't know. It's 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 hard. It's a tough one. I mean, the only way to deal with it is to ask to follow Marnie's advice exactly, but. It's tough to get the courage up to do that. Well, 
Sure. I mean, we're all here because the advice is great, but it's not easy to follow through for sure. That's where it gets Absolutely. Started. Yeah. It, all of it's difficult. That's the thing. But you have to remember that if you're with a partner, um, that's a very safe environment, or at least it should be. And if it's not, then you, you should, probably shouldn't be in that relationship. So even if you're super uncomfortable, you can even do it with your eyes covered while you're saying it and just say, it's really uncomfortable for me to say this, but, you know, they're not going to laugh at you and you'll get your point across. Well, you said I'm not going to laugh at you. I'll save my funny anecdotes for another time. <laughs> yeah, they will laugh in your face. Very. Now, just, since we're in the kind of world of, of sex, here's, here's a question I asked for you, Marty, that we had from someone is, where do we stand now in this day and age? I find that people have kind of gotten a little bit, um, you know, maybe complacent or, or not. I'm not as aware of it, but in terms of, like, sexual past, sexual history, STDs, getting tested, this is less of a fun question. But, like, at what point is the right time to kind of ask that question? Do people even kind of get into that anymore? Yeah, yes, and they, if they're not getting into it, they absolutely should. There are a lot of STTs out there, and there's a lot of unsafe and unprotected sex happening on a, a minute basis. So the thing is, is that you have to remember that your health is the most important thing in the world, right? Um, and I know, as Kevin said before, it's always difficult to ask these questions and to put it out there, but you have to respect yourself and respect your health. And if you don't ask those questions and go into a sexual experience without asking, you're going to drive yourself crazy, you're going to drive the woman crazy, it's going to be a crazy experience. So don't be afraid or shy to ask about a person's sexual past or STD history. And it's the same thing as what I said for the previous question, where you say, I know this isn't a pretty topic to bring up, but um, we're into each other. I know that we are going to have sex very soon, but my health is very important to me and I want it to be very important to you. When was the last time you were tested? It's not a sexy topic. You, it's, not, it's just really owning anything that you say. You know, it's like, it's really important to me. It should be important to you as well. I want to make sure that we're safe. I think that gets into sexual history in general. It's kind of when you have that conversation. Kevin, like being in, getting into long-term relationships in your history, have you, have you kind of had a, an opinion on their sexual history? Do you kind of, does that impact your approach to things when you kind of get I, to I, I think the, the safest, Mike, the safest thing, it for the happy medium of the person who doesn't have the confidence that you know Mari want Marnie wants you to have is just practice safe sex and and protected sex yeah. no matter what so everything is so significantly reduced um, maybe it's not doing oral if you're not going to have that frank conversation but I what oh, I what scares me is I feel like in the 90s we had much more awareness, I feel like, and it seemed like we were much more aware of the need for protected sex. I know from some of my friends in their 20s, hetero and, and homosexual, they're not practicing. Uh, I, I, I think there's um, a lot of misinformation about diseases and how treatable they are, and yeah. uh, they can't kill you anymore. Uh, you know, and whether it's true or not, the diseases are still there and they're still debilitating. And the safest way is just protect yourself and get the courage up to have that conversation and follow Marnie's advice. But if it's too awkward at first, just protect yourself. Or if you're a girl, make sure your guy is protected. Just insist Good on answer. it. Good answer. All right, well, let's shift gears from now that we kind of went from the fun sex part to a little bit more challenging part. Let's talk a little bit more relationship stuff. And if you don't mind, Martin, I'm just going to jump to Kevin for this one first. As yeah, of course. One thing that, that I've always wrestled with, Kevin, is that, you know, that first step with the girl. When you kind of walk up to her for the first time, finding the right approach, you're going out. One of our questions was, you know, I'm going to a party on Friday night. It always freaks me out, kind of making that first move or having that approach. And you're experienced, you're a successful guy. You've got, I mean, we all know you've got a beautiful girlfriend. You know, what would you say to the guy that kind of hesitates and kind of making that first move at a, at a party when he's out? Okay, this is going to sound like terrible advice, but have, <laughs> a, few, have a few drinks. <laughs> you know, I would, I would never do it sober. I probably still couldn't if I were single today. Um, I get a few drinks in me, and then I'm a little looser. And um, and just remember in the back of your head, all that, even if in business, all someone can say to you is yes or no. You know, so... If you approach somebody, that's all they can say. That's the worst thing that can happen. And I think maybe you, you try to approach in a way that doesn't look like you're approaching to get the person's number or to take the person home and have sex with them or to court the person for marriage. It's just innocent, friendly conversation. And then see what happens. So, okay. You know, what we a couple of drinks. Definitely get lubed. 
So get get drunk and completely lie. So I've been doing yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> good on my end. So well, you know what? No, no, no. It's, 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 not, it's, not <laughs> it's not being forthcoming. You know, no, you don't, I, I, you're I going to scare somebody if you when you come in and you come in too strong. And by the way, here's the good thing about just going in to make a friend or make nice conversation. If it doesn't work, you've not offended the other person. You're not as hurt rejection-wise because you're not your those advances aren't being rejected. And at the end of the day, maybe you do make a nice friend. Maybe you did have a, a nice fun time. And so I never that was the other thing too. I think by going to a party focused on your brain to meeting a girl or meeting a guy, that's a problem right from the get-go. I just go to have a good time, have a few drinks with you boys, and see what happens and let good things come from there. And that way you're not let down if you didn't meet anybody. You just went out to have fun. So back when I was single, I later on in the game, I, it was more about going out, getting drunk with my friends, having fun, laughing. I actually made a lot of nice friends, girls who were just friends, through being like that, whether they were bartenders or you know people I ended up drinking with. But once I, I changed it up, I, I changed the game up, then it, it, things got better for me. I, I agree with that approach 100%. Marnie will get you to it. Because I think what Kevin's saying is go out to socialize and meet people in general. Don't necessarily always go out just to, to target. I mean, what do you say about this whole philosophy? Well, I agree with Kevin the alcoholic. In what you said. Um, yeah, you pretty good there, so it's good. <laughs> no, it's actually really funny because uh, Neil Strauss, who wrote the game, he, he said to me, um, the best way to meet women is when I'm not going out to meet women. Like that's the, when most women have been drawn to him, when he's not laser focused on other women and picking them up and taking them home. There isn't like an end goal in place. And I would say that's true for most people, whether it's for work or for sex or for date, whatever it is, when you're not focused or laser focused on that specific outcome, everything becomes a lot easier. So I have, I have two tips on this. So the first one is be interested and be interesting. So this guy who's going to this party this week, like be interested in the people that you're talking to. If they throw something out there, be inquisitive, be responsive, be, res like, be responsive. Listen to what they're saying. Ask more questions about it. And then be interesting yourself. And being interesting doesn't mean that you go skydiving on the weekends. It means that you're actually passionate and excited about the things that you're talking about so that you can expand and share. You tell them, I'm painting my house this weekend and I don't know what color I'm going to choose. I went here to go choose a color. I went there. Whatever it is, you can make whatever you're talking about seem interesting and engaging. So that's the number one tip. The second tip is something that I called OSA which is my method for having attractive conversation. So Kevin was saying, you know, you know, don't make it seem so obvious that you're trying to pick her up. So OSA is observation, sharing, and asking a question. So you break into conversation using an observation. So you cut out all of the formalities, like none of the, hi, my name is Mike, and I saw you from over there, and you're so... You wait, know, wait, 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 that's only happened one time, and let's, let's not speak to that. Thank you. <laughs> all right, forget that. But so, so you cut out those formalities. So you talk to a person as if you're already in the conversation with them so that you know them. So you make an observation about the party. You make an observation about their shirt. You make an observation about how you're feeling at that moment. And then you expand on the observation. So you share. And you're sharing a tidbit of yourself and a tidbit of information that expands on the statement that you've made. And after you share, um, you go into asking a question so that you open the floor up to the woman responding to you or the people responding to you. And you want to ask an open-ended question. So when you're, the, when you're sharing, you want to use words like because or um, what other words, but they'll help you share more and expand on what you're saying. But use OSA, O-S-A, and go out this weekend and just try it. And you can go onto my website, winggirlmethod.com, and I have a video on how to do OSA, giving you exact instructions, because that was a shorter version of uh, an explanation for you. But it's an awesome way to start a conversation. So you got the condensed version of that. Kevin, any more thoughts in terms of yeah, this? Yeah, I, I just follow-ups. You know, I was going to say as well, asking questions is, everything she's saying is so spot on. She just, uh, she's, she's got the science down. But asking them questions, I mean, it's, obviously you'd like to have jokes and whatever, but if you don't know jokes or you're not a funny person, then simply asking questions, observing, as she said, is great. And then 
asking them questions about their lives. It's very easy, and then you can do follow-ups, and um, that's definitely a great icebreaker. And I, I love I love the idea of observing, and and if you can't talk about, if you can't make jokes, and you don't have the amazing one lines, I love yeah renovating something or or whatever. As long as you don't bore them, but most people like yeah. talking about themselves. So I love when you go right in and and based on whatever you see, and you, oh, what do you guys? Drinking tonight. Oh, I noticed you're drinking this, and yeah. and it just asking questions. Where do you work? And and you know, it's being interested to and listening. Like, listen, don't just wait for them to say the last word and then follow up, but actually listen. So okay, no, I think those are both. That's a good yeah. way. To put it. It's it's all about having normal conversation and finding that kind of right rhythm and not overthinking it too much. I guess yes, Marty. Oh, absolutely. There's a thing called conversation threading. So it's like literally like threading the pieces of conversation together. And anytime you're ac sitting across from a person or standing across from a person, they're going to give you all the conversation that you need, especially if you get them to open up a little bit. But what you're trying to do is weave your conversation with their conversation. So if they say, you know what, when I was 14, I used to be a dancer. I loved to dance. And you go, oh, you know what, you're a dancer? That's amazing. I always admired the people who went to dance school who were dancers. I I never danced myself, but I did X, Y, and Z. So that you're, you're threading the conversations together so that you're taking something that they say, responding to it, being interested, and then relating it to yourself. So that it doesn't always have to be, oh, me too, me too, me too, but it's something that you have a similar experience to that can um, semi-parallel what they're talking about. You're trying to, you're trying to relate to a person. Relate so to, exactly. Let's let's shift to something else now. We had two two questions that kind of came in that I think kind of touch upon the same thing. One was kind of asking, you know, about. I mean, I've been here growing up. I remember one girl in particular said, you know, oh, you don't want to fall in love with me. I, I'm nothing but trouble. You know that sort of shtick. And then there's another, you know, nice thing that I think he's about 16 who has a crush on a girl. And I don't want to be he put this great story in, but he gets a feeling she likes him, but she's kind of keeping her distance. It's kind of I guess what we're talking about is what are the signals to know when a girl ultimately is kind of keeping you at a distance because she's kind of being flirtatious, and keeping you at a distance because she really wants you to actually keep your distance. Well, it doesn't sound like this girl actually wants him to keep his distance. She sounds a little bit insecure, like there's something that's happened in her past multiple times where she feels that she's broken in some way and she's not capable of being in a relationship. Because the sentence that you said is, oh, you don't want to get involved with me, I'm tr What was it again? Well, it's exactly. It's, you know, why would a girl say that a guy shouldn't fall in love with her? And what yeah. are the courses of action in such a case? Well, see, that's the thing that like hurts my heart when I hear that because that's that's there's like a sad story attached to that. So that's a little bit different than the situation you were talking about before, and I can speak to that in a minute. Um, but when a girl says something like that, I, I would really try to be the guy that sticks around and says, like, you know, what happened to you in the past? Wh where is this coming from? Because just so you know, like, I don't know what's going to happen between the two of us, but I'm into you. I think you're freaking cool. I think you're interesting. Um, I would never hurt you on purpose. That would never be my goal. But tell me what happened to you because obviously something has. Because women really like to be understood and a statement like that says like I want you to come after me but I'm broken and I've been told I'm broken. So there's an insecurity there for sure. I think I think like I think it's good advice. And Kevin, let me ask you: When you hear that, what I hear sometimes is I hear that the danger of kind of falling into that that dreaded friend zone a little bit by like let me kind of be your shoulder, let me hang out with you, even though you've kind of given me that semi rejection. What are you hearing in that approach? I, I I'm torn. I I hear the rejection in it, and then I also hear a little bit of self-deprecating shtick from the girl too that. I don't know. Is is it's in a way letting her off the hook if things go bad or if do you know what I mean? I told you so. I warned you. Like so, she can date three other guys while she's with you. So I don't. I don't like the. I don't like any of it. To be honest, I, Well, that's I where I'm at. Like as a guy, I mean, I hear what you're saying, Marty. Like as dudes, I hear that, and I kind of want to run for the hills. And at my age, my experience is there. Oh yeah, you got baggage there for sure. <laughs> so, so just letting you know, it doesn't mean like, okay, um, I'm like a little puppy dog, and this is going to be an easy process. It's saying I've got baggage. So, you, as a man, you have to decide whether or not you want to get involved with that. But the thing is, is like taking a step back from that for the men out there, they always have to do what's right for them. So I don't want them becoming the friend zone guys and like sticking around and soothing her and not getting anything out of it. If he's going to stick around to pursue 
her, then he has to be getting something in return. So whether it's intimacy, they're going on dates, they, he can't stick around and be the comforting guy and just be her friend who's there for her when she needs him. The conversation is so that they can take a step forward together. Because only, only because of the way that she phrased it, of like that exact sentence was saying, I'm damaged goods, you should run for the hills. Because that's what I've been told. Or that's what's happened to me in the past. But for other situations where girls are, you know, trying to let you down easily rather than entice you to pursue, um, it, it's, it's, it's all in the way that they phrase things. So it's like, if a girl's not really interested in you, she'll say things like, well, I don't really want to ruin our friendship, or, I, you know, I don't really see you that way, or, you know, I really want to be alone right now and have some me time. Those are more gentle letdowns slash rejections. Um, girls who still want to be pursued, it, they would, they're still going to flirt with you. They're still going to tease you in some way to entice you to be more assertive and lead them in the right direction. So, you know, it, it's a hard line to see. Oh, God, you guys are so yeah. complicated. So I'm, I'm, I've been through that. So, but I, I mean, I agree. It's kind of, there's not an easy answer to that one. I mean, Kevin, do you have any new kind of No, thoughts? I'm with you. Mike, I'm with you. Get out. Just get out. There's two <laughs> girls out there. Just pull out. And to the other girl, the oh, advice. See, I feel so bad for this girl. No, well, but that's what you're, you're not here to worry about the girls, Marty. We're here to worry about the guys. No, I know. I know. Only I mean, because she phrased it that way, which means she's been hurt a lot in the past. So, yeah, I me, agree with you. Like, if me, it's not, it's baggage. Give, me, give this guy the straight guy answer that he needs to hear. Run. Yeah, Kevin, can you tell this yeah, guy? No, I think, no, yeah, it's, I feel bad for her, but I don't know if this is past baggage or if this is her playing games with him, it's just, just move on. That's it. Just move on. There's plenty of other girls out there. And, and by the way, if you move on and go on to something else, if this was meant to be with this girl, she'll, she'll pull it together and come after you. Oh, I, she, agree she, she I agree with that. I agree. I agree. I think that's, that's it. Like, if she is playing a bit of a game and you do move on and take her advice, you might be surprised to find her come back. But that is, that is the way I would kind of go with that. So I if, agree, men. I mean, we're much more simple than you guys are. So let me ask you, this one's a bit more about the confidence stuff, but it's speaking to a specific situation. So I yeah. often find myself hesitating or freezing up in situations like approaching or going in for the kiss or speaking up at work. Uh, I think it might be a confidence, is confidence issue, but I'm not sure. I mean, the one thing in here that I want to highlight is kind of going in for a kiss. That first move, oh. first kind of approach is such a tough act for a lot of guys. I mean, for most guys, you know, when you're in that relationship or you're starting one that's really good, what about going for that first move or kind of taking that leap of faith and standing up for yourself, Marty? What do you say about that? Okay, I have an exercise for guys to do who have trouble taking uh, initiative and taking, like, small risks. So these are kind of small risks, right? Because as you said before, what's the worst thing that happens? You get a yes or a no or you get a rejection or you get, like, a big French kiss for an hour and a half and then possibly sex. So there's, there's like, pros and cons. So the exercise is to inject the phrase, I want into your dialogue every day for five days straight. Because typically people who ask questions like that are not comfortable stating what they want, especially to people that they think could possibly dislike them or hate them, right? So I want a kiss or I want something at work. So I would like you to use the phrase, I'm speaking to the audience now, I want five times per day. Even if you don't have an opinion, Make up an opinion and say, I want. What do you want for lunch? Oh, I don't care. No, I want Chinese food. Even if you don't strongly feel, I want Chinese food, I want you to get comfortable saying the words I want. And that, over five days, you can, you can carry it on for three months if you want to, will help you gain more confidence and realize that you can be that assertive and people are not going to dislike you for it. So that when you do get to a position where you have to go after the first kiss, you can say in your head, I want a kiss. That'll put a smirk on your face, a smize in your eye, and then you can go after what you want. It'll still feel a little uncomfortable, but you can go after it knowing that you're not going to get um, a, a negative feedback. I actually, that's a very good exercise. I, I, I think I might even try that. Kevin, you're a guy who's you know very well accomplished. As uh, you know, you've got. I mean, your Maria Menounos is your girlfriend. You, you're in a long-term relationship. You're not a guy who strikes me as lacking in confidence, but every guy has these moments. What do you think about these kind of little risks and, and kind of approach to risk in general, you obviously don't have much fear, or do you, is it about conquering some anxieties and fears you've had? Oh, my God. I think I, Tons. 
you guys have struck such a chord with asking questions about sex or offering um, suggestions for what you like sex, but probably the second worst thing is the first kiss. And I don't know, Mike, if you've experienced it, but when the girl turns the cheek on you... I'm really hoping I'm, really I'm going to get that first kiss. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, you One know, day. but the first, no, let me rephrase. The first kiss with your partner-to-be or girlfriend or the person you really like in a right. relationship. And I don't know how many times you've gotten the turn of the cheek, but I've gotten it, and it sucks, right? Oh, it's brutal. You just brought me back to an incident I hadn't even thought about in so long. It's, there's nothing worse. Right, right. And so, that, you know, when, when you go in for the kiss the first time in your relationship, hoping it won't be the last, again, be drunk. I'm sorry. I wish I had better <laughs> advice. you got to go to Marty. Like, I've been there. It's so awkward. It's awful. And then, like Whoa. I said, too many turns of the cheek in my past that I don't want to remember. <laughs> well, okay, let me tell you something. It is just as awkward and uncomfortable for women. Your heart is pounding. You're nervous. Um, it, it, it's just as uncomfortable for a woman. But know this as well. When I first started dating my husband, oh, is it frozen? No, no. Oh, my God. I know okay. you're looking at me. I'm not, what's going on, Mike? Trying yeah. to go for that first kiss? Question. Um, uh, when I first saw my husband, our first three dates, I turned my cheek. Oh. But, I knew, but I knew that I liked him, but I wasn't ready to kiss him yet. I hadn't decided if I wanted to do anything, but I wanted to keep seeing him. So my, our first three dates, I turned my cheek, and then on the fourth day, we actually kissed each other. I didn't oh, turn my cheek. No, that guy. Oh. I know, he, he's, he's stuck in there. Holy mackerel. I mean, I, he must have just been hammered by the fourth kiss. I mean, yeah. <laughs> literally, if he's on the Kevin method at that point. I mean, exactly. But I will say this, like Kevin, for me, that one situation you reminded me of, like, it really stuck with me for a while, and it hurt, because it's like a sensitive time in your life, and you think there's something there, but I would regret much more looking back and not having gone for it. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of those, too. Yeah, you're right, where, yeah, you, re you and you regret it the rest of your life in some cases. Yeah, like, at least now, I you know. So, like, to the guys that are kind of asking those questions about, like, how do I know, and this, I mean, one of the blanket statements, we got so many questions, but one thing I would say, like, as a guy, is keep in mind, like, no one ever really knows for sure, the most confident guy that you're right. going to meet, he does not know for sure exactly how it's going to play out. He's confident in himself, but the most confident guy is going to be with the most confident girl, I mean, everyone has their own anxiety, but if you really like someone, you got to trust it, and you got to take that leap of faith, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a guaranteed, you know, um, liberating experience, whichever way it nets up. But you don't want to walk away and a year later wonder if you made that mistake. Marnie, don't you kind of agree with oh, that? Oh, I, com I completely agree. One of the sexiest things that a couple of guys have done to me is they've said, I'm going to kiss you right now. And when somebody says that to you, y you don't say no. You're like, oh, okay. That is 100% a move that I have yeah. And it got to the point, like, through my, like, early 20s where it's like, oh, did you pull your I'm going to kiss you move again? <laughs> Yes, really? I did, but it was like, and it, it works. Was peaceful. Like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, exactly. If it works, you keep doing it. It's the sexiest move ever. It just makes me feel powerless. Like, honestly, I just feel so feminine in that moment because you know that every woman's fantasy is to be, you know, thrown up against a wall and have sex, just like in the movies. So, even, like, that's the... the I do. The, I know that now. I mean, you I... You know that now. But that's, like, the, the more G-rated version of it that could possibly lead to it because the man is showing that he's a leader. He goes after what he wants. He's masculine. Oh, super, super sexy. Even if you haven't won her over during the date, if you can pull that one off, and I would say to practice it in the mirror before you go on dates and even practice up until you have that next date... You can pull it off and be, like, the sexiest person. It's amazing. Kevin, uh, you know, first kisses are, it's one thing to get the kiss, but, you know, is the first kiss, like, a, generally, like, a good kiss? Is it, or is it kind of, like, do you, do you stay in the relationship and that first kiss goes sideways, or do you, does it improve from your experience? Well, the few relationships I was in, the first kiss was pretty magical. It was cool, you know. So I, I don't really remember one one relationship that didn't have a good first kiss. Uh, I think the ones that had bad kisses, I don't think it was ever, it didn't form to a relationship because we had a bad first kiss. So, 
I don't, I don't think I can give you anything profound in that area. No, but I think I think you're right. I think you kind of know something. You learn something. So on this whole thing we're talking about, I think it, it is a bit about communication. And, and another question I just got here, Monty, where you thought I was saying it's frozen. I'm just trying to read some of the questions we're, we're still getting. Uh, you know, there's this expression that's about, you know, how men and women basically fall in love in, in different ways of attraction. You know, uh, men see attraction with their eyes, women with their ears. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, you know, the whole men are from Mars, women are from Venus, that kind of different communication. Is there, you know, how do you breach that kind of middle ground? And, and is, there, are there the, is there kind of like a, a common area where that attraction kind of meets? Or is it about kind of really understanding each other and trying to, you know, feed into each other's, as you said, interweave and thread? Well, okay, so here's the thing. If a man is not attracted to a woman, then most likely it's never going to become a relationship. Like, it's very true. Men, you know, select with their eyes, and looks are way more important to men than they are to women. But something interesting happens for women. So if a woman sees a man and he's approaching her, she sees his face, she sees his features, blah, 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 blah. So all of that happens in the first five seconds before he says hello. And she makes a judgment about him. He's cute. He's not cute. I don't want to talk to him. I do want to talk to him. He's confident, whatever it is. But as soon as that guy approaches and opens his mouth and starts showing his character and making her feel something or not feel something, his face starts to morph and he literally becomes a different man than she saw before. So I was out with one of my girlfriends like a couple of years now and we were out at a bar and she said to me, oh my God, Marnie, that guy is so cute. And she pointed to the guy like sitting next to me and she said, I want to talk to him. So I was like, okay. Tapped him on the shoulder and said, this is my friend Jessica. <laughs> you guys talk now. I left, I left him alone for 15 minutes, came back and she came running up to me and she said, I can't believe you left me alone with him for 15 minutes. He is the most boring person I've ever met in my life. So for her, the looks, you know, got her attention, but then she was like, I'm bored out of my mind, he's the worst person, she was over him very, very quickly, and she was looking for me to save her. So women, women, it's not about the looks, I would say looks are like number five for women. Personality, character, who they are is way, way, way more important. I would say that's probably true, if you use the word women, and I think that's an important distinction. You know, when you're younger, I'd say that's a slightly harder sell to get past some of the stuff, you know, in high school and college. But as we all get older, that stuff for sure becomes a little bit more evident. And oh, for sure. And more interesting, right, as you, as you get older. Yeah. Well, the, the, there's different, like, value levels, right? So when you're in high school, people value different things compared to when you're older. When you're older, you value passion, you value drive, you, you value uh, people who have great jobs, who value stability. Like, there's other things that you value based on your area of needs of life. And when you're in high school, you value someone that's cool, someone that's exciting, someone that has a car, someone that, you know, has cool hair. Those are the things that are important to you. And so even in high school, for me, I was never into the cutest guy. I was always into the goofball or someone who, was, who I, I saw as being cute. A lot of my girlfriends, we, we all had different, um, different picks for the guys that we wanted to be with. So there wasn't always this one person that everybody loved. It was different based on what our, what our values were and what we were looking for at that time. So, Kevin, let me ask you this. As you kind of gone through your dating, like, do you find, like, I guess, first, have you ever been attracted to a woman like, after you kind of got to know her more, has it kind of shifted? And secondly, as you kind of got more successful and maybe more interesting in your life, is that where you started getting approached by more women? Or what's been kind of your history with that? I think women have become, as I've gotten older, they're in, definitely what's inside has become way more attractive. When definitely young clown, it was just all about the love. Yeah. Definitely all about the looks and stuff. Yeah. Sorry, you kind of froze up there. Physical, only to have it totally blow up in your face later. And by the way, a lot of, I know a lot of older guys in Hollywood are still just looks, 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 looks. And, um, but for me, I see, I find attractiveness in someone who's familial, a great work ethic, loyalty. I, this, some of that stuff such a turn on to me now that wasn't when I was younger. Um, yeah, it's just a recipe. I don't know. It's a recipe for disaster if it's just... A lot of people get confused with looks. I mean, they're so physically attracted to somebody. Then they, it's like a drug where it just sedates everything else and you make everything else work in your brain because of it. But at some point, you will tire of that person's looks and you'll just be left with what's left and it won't be pretty. 
Yeah, I yeah. agree. You tend to compromise a little bit and kind of turn up, turn the other cheek or turn a blind eye to some of the things because you're just so into the goal physically that you kind of let that stuff slide. Right. That's a recipe for disaster. But it's a recipe for fun, too. You may be having a fantastic sex. So whatever the experience is, like know what the experience is, but don't try and make them become something that they're not. So let's switch gears for a second to another question that I think is, is a little bit more outside something that maybe that, Kevin, you can't, you don't have, you've been in a relationship for as long as you have. But some people, I mean, we have this on the site all the time, the whole world of, of Tinder and kind of online dating. Let's just talk Tinder for a second. Like, yes, I love Tinder. We got a, a question was really, and it's something that comes around here very often, is are people using Tinder to date? Are people using Tinder to have sex? How do we use Tinder? How do, you know, I'll even take my phone up, show me how to use Tinder. I don't even know anymore. Like, what? You, can use, you can use it for whatever you want. Your intention is your intention, right? And another person's intention is their intention. And you have to go after what you want, and they have to go after what they want. And you have to know your boundaries, and they have to know their own boundaries. Tinder can be an amazing resource for sex, for dating, for making friends, for meeting people in a new city. It is phenomenal. Absolutely amazing. My, my husband was doing a shoot in New York back in, like, oh my god, September, so long ago. And half of his crew were on Tinder, and half of his crew had at least three dates set up for every night after they got off work with girls around the city, like meeting up with different girls who were super cute girls, super fun. Some of them amounted to something. Some of them became a friendship. So there's lots of options out there. So you just have to go with what your intention is and follow through with that. And then it's up to the other person of whether or not they want to give that into you. Kevin, in your world, is, uh, is, is Tinder, do you have the guys who are kind of, you know, in your circles who use either Tinder or just kind of online dating? Is that something that you see? Um, you know, Mike, I'm, I'm out of the game so long. I'm like an <laughs> old washed up athlete that uh, I don't know about it, but actually through Marnie I learned about it. And I actually, Joe Gear, who's, um, He's on Chasing Maria, our reality show, uh, our security guy. He's on it, and uh, he's having some fun with it. And I know a lot of people that have, I know a lot of people that meet online, guys and girls, are part of dating sites. So well, the first thing that I hear is, I'm a little concerned your security guy is on Tinder. So make sure he's not <laughs> is that bad. On Tinder, who knows what he's missing? That's for sure. Tinder can yeah, be great. He's just like. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I encourage it because he's, if I always say if you are single and you don't want a relationship and you're honest, guy or girl, just be honest with yeah. that person, the other person. And if the other person is like, great, I just want to have fun too. But where Joe is single right now, he's on TV, I'm like, have fun, <laughs> you know, knock, knock yeah. yourself out. You know, just leave my host, my 200 hosts at AfterBuzz alone. Yeah. But everyone else there is free game. <laughs> I love that. I think, it's, I think it's become a much more common part of, of the experience with people out there. So I think. Oh, like, for sure. For sure. The thing is, there's there's pros and cons to online dating. The con is there's lots of options. The pro is there's lots of options. So that you know people don't feel okay that they have to select somebody because there's lots of options. But then you also have a world of options out there. It's just a, it's just another resource for you instead of um, you know when people in like 50 years ago, they, they had limited options for who they could possibly date, so they could select from a small pool of people. Now we have this huge pool of people that we can look at and see and select and like read about them and watch videos about them before we decide to engage with them. And it's, it's a great additional resource for meeting people. Right. You still have to go out, you still have to interact with people, you still have to socialize, um, and don't use these things as a crutch, use them as an extra tool for dating. I agree. In fact, I think it's pretty much, I wrote an article about the same thing, and I agree with you. It's like we've got access to this great toolbox, like why not use everything with the right strategies, but yeah. people, if people didn't have, what you had was, can I get her number, Am I gonna, what, what party am I maybe going to see her at again? You know, it's, now there's so many ways that you can kind of keep that relationship or try and start something going that you didn't have Exactly. Before. Exactly. Oh, me and my husband, when we were watching all of his crew going out, we're like, oh my god, we want to be on Tinder. <laughs> we were like, should we sign up and see what happens? Oh. It's, it seems so fun. It seems awesome. And plus, it's an ego boost, you know? You get people telling you you're hot all day long. Not a bad thing. Yeah, I, that is not a bad thing. That is a good reminder for, for those of us that are hot. And yes, it's great. For the other ones, it might be slightly different. But kind of sad, yeah. So, I, got, I just got a great question, actually, on chat that is something that I think... Kevin, for sure, you must have had some experience in your life with this. Marty, for sure you too. There's always that person that you kind of, and I've been guilty of it on both sides, 
that you know when they don't have anybody else, you're getting that reach out. You're getting that call. You're getting that kind of like let's hook up uh, ten o'clock on Saturday night, or maybe not even like the ten o'clock on Saturday night. But what are you doing this Saturday? And kind of going out for a date. But it's kind of they only pop back into your life when they've got nothing else going on. What do you kind of think about those relationships that kind of go on for that period of time? Well, you, again, like what I've talked about before you have to decide your own boundaries and you have to recognize when that is happening. So that's somebody who's up for the fun experience. They may not really be into you the way that you are into them or the way that you want them to be. Um, so in that situation, it's totally up to you. If you can handle that, she's only going to reach out to you when she has nothing going on. And when you guys go out, you have a fun time and that's it. You're not going to get anything else. Have a blast with her. Go go have like an amazing two day weekend, and then have her disappear for three weeks. And when she reaches out again, take her out again. But if you can't handle it and you keep wanting something more, then you have to stop uh, connecting with her and answering her because it's just it's just gonna drive you crazy. No, I agree. I think that's the same thing. Kevin, have you ever been in one of these? I mean, again, I know you're the the, the athlete that's out of the game, but you ever <laughs> kind of been someone's crutch that even when you've been in your relationship, they keep trying to reach out? Something along those lines? Um, once. And it was awesome. <laughs> you know, like, come on, this is grace. You know, if she's, I mean, but if you do start developing feelings, I think that becomes a problem. But if she's calling you to hook up. I mean, we're guys. We love that. We wait for that, Marnie. So, yeah, oh, I know. Um, have fun. No, so don't fall. Just listen. Just treat it for what it is. Keep living your life, but enjoy the ride. But if it's really confusing your brain and hurting your feelings, then. Yeah, you got to try to pull the troops out of Nam. But I don't know, it sounds pretty cool. I really, you know, I wish I had that more when I was back in the day. Yeah. No, it sounds like an awesome situation. Like, why not? Go have fun with somebody who wants to have fun when they want to have fun. I mean, we talked about first kisses before. There was another question that I, I it's not in the more recent chats that I came across. We talked about first kiss, but one thing that I'd written about a while back is first time you have sex with someone that you like, Marty. I mean, that. That can be a very awkward thing. I mean, it's the first time, yeah. unless you're kind of lucky and it's that first date, and everyone is, as we follow the Marty program and the Kevin program where they do six shots and everything's super easy. Right. Together, we have the Kevin Wing Girl method, I think it's phenomenal. But if you <laughs> find yourself where you really like someone, and that first night is kind of awkward, not because people don't want to be there, but things go kind of weird. How do you recover from that first night awkward experience if both of you kind of want to get back in there? That could be a bit tough to kind of power through. Well, it's going to be an unsexy answer, but it's really communication. You know, you've, you've been inside somebody, so I think you can have a real conversation with them after that and nice. talk to them. You just say you've been inside somebody? Yes, yeah. exactly. If you've been inside somebody, then you can have a conversation. There's a difference between unsexy and just hardcore real. That's, that's good. You just put <laughs> yeah. it down for us. Thank you. But that's the thing, like, you know, it's not going to be perfect the first time. It's not. In the, you know, if we take Kevin's method of, of drinking, that especially for the first time, it's not going to be that much fun. Uh, it's going to be awkward, especially if you really like the person. You're going to be putting a lot of pressure on yourself. She's going to have a lot of pressure on herself. So the thing is, is that if you both still are into each other, then you just you just continue trying and you make it better and you ask more questions and you you know maybe get better at reading her body language and you get better at learning her sounds and you get better at being in the moment instead of thinking five steps ahead about how you really want to pleasure her and rock her world. So you know especially when you really like somebody it can be very daunting to have sex with them. But if you really like each other then it will eventually get better because both of you will calm down and not worry about it as much. Kevin, what about you? Have you kind of had that situation where you got to power through or, or any other experiences in the realm of kind of like that awkward moment that you got to kind of get around? No, the drinking, why are we make, Why is the drinking getting such a bad rap? <laughs> the drinking is, oh, is, is a great aphrodisiac. It, it, it totally has, is. No, we're busting your cuff. It is very, I agree, it's, it's good. Don't let, don't let the two Canadians pick on you. Yeah, a great entry level uh, into the relationship. And, uh, you know, for me, I guess I've been lucky because when those few times I've had sex for the first time has been good, it's always led to a relationship. So I guess I've been lucky. Yeah, very so, lucky. You've got a pretty good track record over there. No real Seriously. Surprise. Great yeah. kisses, great sex. Everything's been awkward for me. So, Kevin, let me ask you this then. Since we're just, we'll just go off the kind of questions, for them because this is a question I did. It's good for everyone. If been, how long have you been in a relationship? How long have I been in a relationship? Right now, your current relationship. Oh, 16 years. 
So, it's, so how do you keep things exciting? Without getting too personal, I don't want to put you a but like that's a big concern for a lot of guys that I know about. Like they can't even, you know, marriage has kind of shifted, uh, long-term relationships have kind of shifted the perception of guys. Like, how do you keep things exciting in a long-term relationship like that? I think that you have. Marnie will tell you this too. You have to work at it, and a lot of people don't. They quit. I know. Um, I know a lot of couples get just too tired with parenting. I know sometimes mothers with the children, it's just too much to have to constantly take care of the kids, kids. And by the time the other person or the husband wants to do it, the woman's not ready. I have also known it to be the other way around. And I think it's being like guy or girl, um, you know what, I'm not into it, but we need to do this. We need to do this or we will become platonic like I see a lot of couples do. Yeah. And then, again, I go back to alcohol. <laughs> and dating, yes, I agree with that. I'm in it for alcohol with that answer as well. Well, well Barney, listen, Marie and I, uh, you'll see it on our reality show, but there's a moment we go, she's like, we need to drink more. And I said, I've been saying it for years. And so we're at a point now where the reality show's on the air and we're about to get onto a book tour and Marie has a lot of big things happening in the future. So it's kind of a little bit of a calm. And we, we've been... Drinking more and it's fun. It's really I, 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 I hate to keep going back to it, guys, but I'm just being <laughs> honest with you. We're having so much fun at like four in the afternoon cracking a beer. We never would do that. Now it's like we're doing it and it's it's been fun. Our yeah, the I love it. Honestly, that was a huge thing for my husband and I too. We we started um, implementing Friday happy hours. We would as soon as our gardener would come to our house. That's when the day was over because we both work from home. So the, the day would be over and we'd go for a happy hour and have a couple of cocktails and have a blast with each other and just talk about stuff that isn't stressful and have fun and get a little buzz on. And it was absolutely amazing. So I, com I completely agree with that. Adding on to the alcohol, um, you have to remember that your husband is still a man or your partner is still a man and uh, I, I'm or the Remember's other side. Right. What? We want to talk to the guys here a little bit. I think, like, yeah. I mean, it's, but, but I'm saying that, and then I'm still a woman. The the really important thing is to remember that at the core, this person that you're dating, yeah, she's your girlfriend or she's your wife or she's whatever she is for you for a long time. But at the core, she's still a woman and wants to feel that way. She wants to feel feminine. She wants to feel wanted. She wants to feel desired. She wants to feel sexy. Those things are needed on a daily basis. So sexting is super helpful. Um, coming like waking up in the morning and grabbing your girlfriend's ass or your wife's ass in the morning and you know kissing her on the neck and making her feel sexy all of those things are wonderful so that you're still flirting and teasing and bantering and challenging your significant other the second that you forget that this girlfriend of yours is a woman that's the second you start losing your relationship okay I think that sums the relationship I mean I definitely think alcohol it wasn't kind of rag on that I think it is good whenever we do relax it's obviously a better thing but I mean, yeah. we're kind of getting to the end of it now Marty we did get one question that I kind of have to, I wanted to save to the end because it is like a, a question that every guy is going to ask a girl at some point in their life and it relates to the idea of size. So we had one of our readers ask like, what is the true, and it's a massive gear shift from loving relationships, but what is the true, like, is there an average size for a penis? We'll there is an average size. Oh, oh well, there, there is an average, let me put it this way, I mean, that's the phrasing of this question, but just give us your take on size. A lot of guys out there have anxiety about the size of their penis. I mean, let's just come right out there and say it. Like, is there, should they be anxious about it? I mean, no. Large, like, no, they shouldn't. Listen, just because you have a huge penis does not mean that you know what to do with it. I have been with people on all areas of the spectrum, and the ones with the bigger penises are not the rock stars in the bedroom. The ones with the smaller penises actually do better in the bedroom because they try harder. Yeah, and you're awesome. like, yes! Um, <laughs> They do. They absolutely do. Because a lot of guys who are bigger just are like, okay, I have a big penis, I have lots of sex, and I know how to thrust. They haven't really learned about how to pleasure a woman. And pleasuring a woman, being connected to a woman during sex, knowing all of her spots, like you can give her a much better, better orgasm, a much better experience, being knowledgeable in the bedroom versus having a big penis in the bedroom. And actually, they just did this study. Somebody sent it to me this morning. It was it was some people in Africa or something where they did a study that men who have bigger penises um, 
they have a higher propensity for their wives to cheat on them. Wow. I mean, I think we should actually literally explore that further on, on Ask Men. Is that... You totally should. I'll, I'll send you the article, but I just got it today. I'm right... I'm going to be writing an article about it soon because I want to go deeper into the study about why it is. But it was from people in Kenya, I think. But they were saying that their more their wives cheat on them more. Wow. It's, yeah. I don't really know the reasoning for it, but yeah, so the, the bigger the penis, the higher the chances are that your wife's going to cheat. So bottom line is that we don't have to rely too much. Whoever in those questions was a little bit nervous about it, size is not everything. There are a lot more things. No. Then the thing okay, the thing is is that like I, I got a lot of questions like this too at the wing girl method. Um, and, you know, guys ask about, does my penis size matter? Does it matter that I'm a virgin? That's a big question as well. Or does it matter that I'm not as experienced in the bedroom? And so here's what I tell all of these guys is educate yourself. That is how you're going to beat out these other people that you perceive as being better than you. If you educate yourself, if you learn about sexuality, if you learn about a woman's body, if you learn how the clitoris works, how your body works, if you, if you visualize in your mind and practice, like, you can be a much better lover than somebody with a huge penis and who slept with 200 women. So, Kevin, let me ask you a question. Do you think with all your years of sexual do you, do you think we as guys can really, like, ever get to a point where just as, the, as average guys, like, we know that we're experienced, you know, do you, or do you always feel like I have more to learn? Where do you kind of live on that spectrum? I think, I think there's always more to learn. The main thing is, is to try. So yeah. if you... If you go in and you try, you're halfway there. You're really trying to please the girl, trying to make her happy, not making the experience so much about yourself, which I think a lot of guys do. Girls may do it too, but I know a lot of guys too. When I, when I was younger, that was a problem of mine. Um, but try to take the other person's needs into consideration. And I, I love the idea of Marnie's idea. Yeah, do, why not do your homework so you can be that much better when you do try? But if you try, you're going to be okay. A lot of people don't try. A lot of people just, it's all about them and yeah. please themselves. You know? Yeah. So there's a lot, you know, I, I agree with that. I think that would apply. I think it's a good way to kind of get to kind of wrap this up and say, like, what we're talking about is putting in an effort. We're talking about communication. We're talking about making sure that you kind of take the time to understand the person you're dealing with. I mean, all these are all common denominators, Mari. So maybe you could just kind of give us, like, a your kind of overarching thought like that, that I'm kind of talking about here is, Communication, right, as, as you were saying before. Yeah, oh my God, absolutely communication. But, but even more so, I, I, love to, I would love to wrap this up with um, the lesson of, of, of trying. Because I think that was a great point that Kevin just made. Like, it is all about practice and trying, like putting yourself out there. Because you were asking about confidence before. And confidence is only gained through taking risk and putting yourself out there and trying. And I know that a lot of people say, okay, well, I want to be a master with women, but I'm here now. Um, how do I get from here to here? And that, that middle zone in between is really, really scary because you haven't broken it down into steps and it seems like it's impossible to ever become a master. So what you have to do is break everything down into small, achievable steps that, that have slight risk for each one. And then you can start going through all of the steps to becoming a master, but it's all about putting yourself out there trying and practicing. And if you practice every day for three months, doing the exercise I told you about with I want or OSA, you will become a master very, very quickly. But you have to stick with it, and you actually have to try. I agree with you. I think that is a very good message to, to end on. Kevin, uh, I can't thank you enough for kind of chiming in here and giving us another male perspective uh, from your end. I think uh, you can simply say that there's... Uh, there's some common denominators that all guys kind of go through, so thanks so much for kind of popping in and sharing your, your method on your end. We won't make any more of the, the drinking jokes because I... No, maybe it's called the buzz method. <laughs> that would be a great way. Kevin, uh, you should kind of lock that one in. So if you want to just mm -hmm. uh, say goodbye to everybody, and uh, thanks for being here. No, oh my God. Thank you, Marnie, and, and Mike, thanks for having me on. It's always It's been fun to watch your show, so it's nice to be part of it, too. Great, thanks so much. And uh, Marty, uh, we'll, uh, you can tell everybody safety that we will be doing this again soon. We got so many questions; it's hard to get to all of them. And obviously, like um, we can't stay here for for the whole the whole evening. But hopefully, we'll be doing this again soon. So, any parting words to all your 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 wing girl method fans? 
Yeah. Well, thanks for, for joining on my first Google Hangout ever. We will definitely be doing this again shortly. Um, but go check out my website, winggirlmethod.com, and listen to the Ask Women podcast that you can get on iTunes, where we answer tons more questions, just like these ones. Okay, guys. If you can't get enough there, please make sure to come and check out Ask Men whenever you can. We have loads of loads of articles and videos that talk to all these topics on our site. So, and we promise you, we will be back here probably in a couple of weeks. Another one. So, stay tuned. Check in with Marty. Check in with me. And thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you guys the next time. So, take care. Bye.